Hey guys, National Master James Canty III here with Chess.com, and today we have member game analysis. But before we get started, make sure you submit your games right now. Click on the link under the video. You need to submit your games so that hopefully yours can be chosen for some member game analysis. Now, I really worked hard on this study for you guys today, and we got some key points and some stuff we want to cover today. So number one is going to be gambits. What is a gambit? What is it? What does it do? Number two is going to be what to do in the opening. I usually like to break it down into three steps of what you should be doing in the opening. And then number three is looking at your options. There's so many options in chess, but sometimes how do you choose the right one? It's uh, it's it's very difficult, but we're going to get some um, some insight today on how these things work. And let's see who today's member is, Platypode Legion. So Platypode Legion submitted their game to the forum, and we chose this one. So shout out to you, Platypode Legion. Now, let's look at this. Platypult Legion played the black pieces in this game. So we're going to check out from here. So let's see. D4 and E5. Wow. Usually you'll see stuff like D5, C5, anything else. D5, Knight of Six is sort of the modern kind of stuff with Nimzo, Indians, Kings, Indians, all types of different openings, right? So after E5, this is very, very interesting. Why? Because he's just literally just giving up material out of the opening. That's a gambit. What is a gambit? A gambit is when you sacrifice material for some type of advantage, usually it being a pawn and usually with the white pieces as well. But a gambit is when you give up something to get some type of advantage. And in this case, it's a pawn. So let's see what happened. D4, E5 captures. Now they say, they always say, there's a quote out there that the best way to refute or beat a gambit is to actually accept it. So white has accepted the gambit. Hopefully black can hold up their end. So let's see what happens. After d4, we have knight to c6. So we're developing. We, and it's very good to develop in the opening. We have to get our pieces out. Chess is a team game, so you need to develop a lot more. So after knight to c6, we have knight to f3. And then after knight f3, we have f6. Very interesting move. Shout out to Ben Feingold. But he always says, don't play f6 or f3. Pushing that f pawn, right? A lot of times there is an issue pushing the f pawn. Why? Because this diagonal is very, very open here. And it's not really good to do that a lot of times. Also, where the king sits on g8 here, the diagonal is very open for this bishop to come into c4 with devastating results sometimes. But in this case, the development is not there for white. So we can make a move like this f6 and kind of uh, provoke white into capturing so we can get another piece to develop via the knight or the queen. So let's see what happened. Pawn takes. Actually, no. Bishop to f4 was played here. Bishop f4 and also pawn takes was an idea here. If pawn takes, then of course the gambit is uh, actually a little bit better for black in this case, just because of the fact that we take back and we're now developed. But it's at the cost of a pawn. So we have to justify later on to say why we are down a pawn because of this, because of that. In this case, it doesn't seem like there's much compensation, to say the least. For white, I mean for black, um, being down the pawn that he is in this case. But uh, after bishop to f4, we have bishop to c5. Gambits a lot of times. I like to play the scotch gambit if you know what that is. That's a, a you play it with white. You play it with the white pieces. But I love playing the scotch gambit. And I know that the, the gambits are usually about rapid development. So the faster you develop, the better it's going to be with this gambit, especially if it's out of the opening. So after bishop to c5 here, we are pointing at the f2 square, which is the soft point for black it to be f7. A lot of times it's a soft point to hit the king um, kind of thing here. Pawn takes on f6. I don't think this was a good move by white because it helps white, it helps black to develop. Sometimes you can take a pawn in a gambit, but the more greedy you get, sometimes it gets worse for you. So you want to be careful with that. And white doing this just helps out black tremendously. And after queen takes f6, now there's a double attack on the board. Queen is now hitting the bishop, but also hitting a b2 square, which could be devastating at some points if white is not careful here. So let's follow on. Let's see what happened. Bishop takes c7. So this is really not a good move. Of course, we just talked about being greedy. You really kind of don't want to be greedy. Sometimes it's okay to be greedy in chess. Trust me, sometimes it is. You're taking everything, but not all the time, and especially when pieces aren't developed. You need to develop, and that moves into the opening phase. When you're in the opening, there's usually three phases. Number one is you got to develop. You have to get the pieces out. You got to get your pieces out. You got to get the army out. I always like to use sports. You got to use the team. You can't just use one or two pieces or move or use one guy. 
so many times. So going back to this, it's uh, we, we have to develop. That's number one. Number two is we have to castle. Castle, you have to make sure the king is safe. If the king is not safe, you're not going to have a good game. It's about checkmating the king. So if your king is not safe, then you will get checkmated most times. And if you find yourself in that position, you probably aren't castling. I have a lot of students that have done that. And <laughs> they castle when the game gets better. That's how it goes. So number one, develop. Number two is castle. Number three, this is the hardest one, is making a plan. A lot of people don't know how to make a plan. And that's pretty tough. It does take experience. It does take, um, you know, you knowing a, a, a little bit more than the average player a lot of times uh, when you're making a plan. But number one and two is definitely you have to do that. Got to develop. We got a castle. So let's see what happened. Bishop takes c7 here. Queen takes b2, hitting the rook. Very, very nice move here as we capture we're threatening a rook. You want to make as many threats as you possibly can because that's very good. And um, now we go knight b to d2 and then knight to d4. Knight to d4 is an aggressive move. It's very nice. And, of course, as you play a gambit, if you are down any kind of material, it's better to play aggressive. Now, the funny thing is you should probably try to play aggressive all the time. The more aggressive you play, the faster you win sometimes, of course. There's always exceptions in chess. But, you know, playing aggressive is not really a bad thing. So knight to d4 was played. Bishop to e5, not a big fan of this move. It looks pretty good. It looks really good, actually, um, because of the fact that the bishop is pinning the knight to the queen back here. And we're also hitting the g7 pawn, which is connected to the rook, which picks up just more material for white, which is good. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, when someone moves, what are they threatening? And you have to cover all the squares. That leads us to our third point looking at your options where are the options that the knight can go to so if we go back here and white asks themselves hey where are the options that the knight can go to where are the squares well we have knight to f3 knight to c2 e2 and all these other squares but where's the most aggressive or the best square for the knight to go to and that would be the c2 pawn this knight d4 yes of course we are threatening to trade but at the end of the day the biggest square is the c2 square that's connected to the rook, but also the king won't be able to move. So we'll even pick up the queen on that one. So this is just uh, not good for white if they play anything other than protecting that pawn or getting rid of the knight on d4. He plays bishop e5, looks good, but he's on his own agenda. And you have to make sure that you look at all your options, guys. You got to make sure you do that. So after bishop to e5, knight takes c2, platypote legion plays that, an awesome move. And now white is completely lost in this position. Now after queen takes c2, because it's the only move that white could play. Queen takes on c2. And we're doing quite well here. Now we always have to uh, um, make sure that we know material counts. You have to know what everything is on the board. So you know when to trade and what not to trade. We have bishop takes g7. He's now hitting the rook here. And then we follow up with knight f6. Knight f6 is a good move. What does that follow? Phase 1 of the opening. You have to develop. Make sure you develop. So of course when we go back here. This rook is actually, of course, hanging now, but we can't really do much about it. So the knight has to develop or go somewhere else. You gotta get your pieces out, get the army out, get the guys together, okay? Use your players, use your best players. So knight f6 just makes sense, very nice. And then after bishop takes the rook, we have knight to e4, threatening to trade. It always says trade when you're up and not when you're down a lot of times. So black is technically up in exchange here, and exchange meaning for the queen for the knight. And the queen is more powerful than a lot of the pieces, as we know. So knowing this, trades usually will actually help black here. And it also helps, trades actually also help the the um, the player that is more developed in this, in this case. So let's see what happened. Knight takes c4, queen takes c4, and then rook to c1. Rook to c1 is he has to do something. Make as many threats as you can. So he's putting the rook on a c file. He really would like to castle here. But how many moves did that take? I'll let you... Uh, pause and, and look at that. How many moves does it take for the king to castle? One. Move the bishop and castle. So that takes one, two, about three moves. It takes about three moves to castle. But black may be able and should be able to win within three moves. Actually already winning. So it's just going to get worse at this point. So let's see what happens. After bishop to b4 check, very nice move. Hitting the king, you have to start checking him. Now you have to start checkmating him. But we need we need our other pieces because playing with just two pieces is cool. But usually it takes three pieces for a successful attack. So if you got two pieces, that's cool. Try to look for that third piece, and sometimes you'll find a masterpiece in there. So let's see what happens. Knight to d2 was played. 
Uh, there's still a pin on the king or the knight to the king. Queen is not actually hanging. So bishop takes d2, not a bad move. He could have just sat the, the bishop there because it's not moving anyway, or the knight's not moving. So he could have maybe did something else, maybe like d6 or a6 or even b6 to swing try to swing the rook over to c8 you got to focus on all of your guys and that's what makes really great chess players so bishop takes d2 then we after bishop takes we have king takes d2 so now the king cannot castle after you move your king or uh, capture with your king or you can't castle in or out of check um the king can't castle so now we've lost our right to castle and we're down in exchange it's very very tough for white to make any kind of play here we're only using two of our guys here and another two are locked away. So this is very, very bad for for um, white here. And that just goes from you can't even get out of phase one of the opening is you have to develop the pieces. If you don't develop the pieces, you can't get to phase two or phase three and even creating the plant. So make sure that you develop. Um, king e1, queen takes a2, and now we just pick up some material. It's okay to be greedy in this kind of position now because we are up some material. We'd like to go up some more material. The king can't castle, it's not as safe. Pieces aren't developed. Everything is wrong with white's position here. Queen takes a2. Um, we have e3 on the board. White is still trying to figure something out. What's phase one again? Develop. So he has to get the pieces out. The bishop has to move for this rook to even think about doing anything. So it makes sense he would make a move like e3. d5 is very nice. What does that do? Exactly the same thing as what white did. Just trying to get the bishop out somewhere and then follow up by bringing a rook to that file. We also have past pawns here and past pawns must be pushed because they are the future queens or the future pieces that will help out and you get more material on, on the board. It makes it easier for you to win. So these pawns should definitely be in the near future to be queened and promoted actually. So bishop to b5 check was played. We played bishop to d7. Trades will help us. So makes a lot of sense. Bishop takes, king takes and bishop to e5. The rook was threatening this bishop here. So actually, let's go back. The rook was threatening the bishop, and we don't want him to just take it. So after rook to, rook to um, actually, rook the rook is threatening the, the bishop on h8. So that's what's going on here. And then the bishop goes to e5, and then we move oh, rook over to c8. Very, very nice move. Just getting it in the file. Rooks love open files. So if you ever ask yourself, how do I get my rook in the game? Where's the open file? It's probably where you should put it. So the rook on c8 is doing very, very well here, opposing this rook on c1. Now we have a rook to d1, and then we go king to e6, threatening the bishop. But it's very nice in end games, and usually end games will come when queens start, queens start to trade off. The more pieces that come off, the closer it gets to the end game. And it's okay for the king to run to the center of the board because the king now becomes a real piece. So it's very good to actually move that king into the center of the board and that's exactly what black did here great job platypole legion putting the king on a safer square away from checks and captures and also defending and attacking the bishop that's on e5 very nice move after that we have bishop to d4 and then a5 the pawns are starting to be pushed and you need to promote one of them that's definitely the goal rook to d2 that's just not a move not a good move and rook to c1 check ouch Hitting here, this is a big skewer is what they call it. And now we're going to pick up even more material here. King to e2. And this move for black is the move of the game right here that I would say that was like a wow moment. And a wow moment doesn't have to be good to say the least. Queen takes d2. Wow. Queen takes d2 is a move. But you, when you find a good move, you have to look for a better one. That goes to the third point of today is actually looking at your options before you move you got to check all your options check for the checks and check for the captures where is the option what are my other queen moves i got b1 i have a1 which is not that good because of the bishop i could take it which was happening in a game i could even go rook to c2 but we're missing the best check here queen to c4 check queen c4 check man that is such a great move there because you're able to check him and you're also able to pick up the rook on h1 as well with no troubles at all no troubles at all and it's easier to win with a queen on than it is with a queen off unless you're sacrificing the queen or something but it's easier for you to win with this queen and and after you check him here rook takes uh, wherever the king moves probably here rook takes and then we just win easily um, much easier than what happened in the game so going back to what happened in the game queen takes d2 not a terrible move of course we're still winning but we rather went faster here. So rook takes h1, and then h3 was played. 
rook to h2, threatening both of the pawns here. So if we push one, we capture the other. King to e2 was played, and rook takes g2, just taking more material. Our main focus is promoting one of these pawns as we go and win the game here. Okay, um, we have h4 on the board, rook h2, not a problem, just picking off another pawn. And then after bishop to b6, we should focus on pushing this and promoting. And that's what happened. a4 was played, bishop to d8, defending this pawn here. Because if you take it, rook takes h4, bishop takes h4, and that is almost devastating. You may actually still be able to win this um, if that happened, right? But uh, just because of the past pawns. But a3 was played, very nice move after a3. We have bishop to a5. After bishop a5, a2, and then bishop to c3. Okay, bishop c3, and rook h4. Rook h4 was very, very weird in a way. Of course, if you want to promote, focus on that plan. So you want to promote, so you would do rook h1. Rook h1 is just a better move to make, because after rook h1, then there's no way of stopping the queen, and it's just simple there. It's just very simple. So after rook h4, um, king to d3. Rook to a4, we could have went back rook h1 again just to queen that pawn. It would have just been much easier. e4 was played. We took with a check king e3 and we queen. There's a queen on the board. Now he has to take it or he's just going to lose much faster. Bishop takes, rook takes, king takes. And now once again we have another pawn that can run to the races, promote here. The best way, the easiest way to do this is actually just cutting the board off first. Putting a rook somewhere where the king can't go. So he cannot cross this line. And because he can't cross this line, means I can just push this one all the way through and uh, and have an easy, easy game there. Well, the move in the game was actually rook to f1, understandable. It is hitting this pawn here. And then, wow moment number two of the game, rook takes f3. Whoa, hands on the head. What just happened? Rook takes f3. Not that you're losing by far at all. There's no way white could actually win this game. But the fact is that, of course, it goes back to you want to win faster. Keep the, keep the rook on the board, and there's nothing really white could do with that pawn by himself. He needs more than just a pawn to win, and also uh, we just queen our pawn through here. So you have king takes f3, and we're going to fast forward here where we just keep going, and the, the pawn finally queens. Excellent job. We cut the board off. So this is very simple, a very simple elementary checkmate, they would call it. And now you want to cut the board off. You want to get the king and the queen in coordination together as the queen cuts off the board. Queen cuts off the board so the king can't progress. And then we bring the king a little bit closer each time. But if he keeps backing up, then we keep cutting off the board and making the box smaller and smaller and smaller until the king comes in and helps out with the checkmate. So here, and we keep cutting the board off, more cutting off of the board. And king walks up, king to the corner. Now an issue, don't do this, will be getting too close. Well, now if he makes a move like queen f2, this would be so bad. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I just did that. Will be that kind of move where the king can't move, you can't step in the check, and they call that a stalemate, which we want to avoid, um, unless we want the stalemate. That's different, right? But king to h1, and after that he made the correct move, king to g3, stepping the king in, small box, once the king moves, it's checkmate. And that's what happened here. Checkmate on e1. Very good job, Platypole Legion. That's awesome. Now, let's recap, guys. We got to recap on what happened. Remember, what is a gambit? A gambit is when you give up a pawn for some type of advantage. Or not just a pawn. It could be anything. But you want to give it up for some type of advantage. So, check out some gambits. Maybe look at some videos on chess.com. It'd be awesome. Number two is, what do you do in the opening? You have to make sure that you develop. That's number one. Number two is castle. And then number three, you want to create a plan. And that's going to be the toughest for most people, but at least you know number one and two. Number three will be pretty easy coming uh, later on when you get that experience um, from there. So this was awesome. You guys are awesome. Um, shout out to Platypult Legion again. Hey, guys, make sure that you submit your games. you got to submit those games. So hopefully yours will be chosen for some member game analysis, and hopefully you guys can learn with us today. I'm James Canty, National Master James Canty. Thank you so much for watching Memory Game Analysis today, and I'll see you on the next one.